that? Oh, brilliant. Yeah, we're now live. John. Okay, well, hi. Well, welcome, everybody. Um, uh, this is a meeting of the I greater... Oh, hang on. Everyone else go on mute. We should have known that. We're two years into this now. Right, good. Thank you. So welcome to this uh, meeting of the Greater Norwich Growth Board. It's the 6th of October. It's two o'clock. And uh, we've got quite an agenda. There's 165 printed pages on the agenda. But if you have been diligent, as I have been, and uh, gone through all the attachments and appendices, there's probably about over 2,000 pages that sort of are forming you know, part of the, the suite of documents which we're considering today. Um, we'd, I'd like to welcome the members, 20, of, 20 here at the moment, who are going to be participating in this meeting. Uh, we're still waiting for Andrew, Andrew Proctor. I'm sure he's on his way. Uh, no, just... I'm actually in, John. Um, ah. I'm, told to think, so I'm in. I'm just waiting to get my... Uh... Uh, video working so here. Well, in that case, we're corrupt, so that's wonderful. Um, are there any apologies for absence, Claire, otherwise notified? No, Chairman. No, good. Uh, any declarations of interest? There's quite a lot going back there. Good. Well, in that case, um, we'll go to the minutes on page four. They're pretty straightforward. I just reviewed them earlier. Does anybody have um, anything on matters of fact? On the observations they want to make. The GNIP, which is the substantive item, was sort of covered, is on today's agenda. Uh, Sean, you want to come in? Thank you, Chairman. Uh, yeah, just I'm flagged on the minutes as being present and I wasn't. Oh. Uh, sent my apologies. So the minutes just need to be updated to reflect that I wasn't okay. there. Okay. If possible, please. I didn't keep the register, so I didn't pick that one up. Thank you. Are there any other points? No? Okay. Well, in that case, um, we've got a, an agenda item, the first one, which is a project showcase. Sarah, you're going to come and talk to us. It's a verbal update uh, from the Broad and Country Park. So, Sarah, do you want to go first? How long do you think you need? Great. Thank you, Chairman. Probably 10 15 Ten minutes, minutes okay. de depending on how much grilling so, I get afterwards. Okay, so if it goes beyond 16 minutes past, I'll sort You're of raise guillotine me. That's well fine. Thank so, you. Over to you. Great. So Le Leah's got a presentation she's going to share, and I'm going to do the boring next slide, please, bit as we go, if everyone's uh, okay with that. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. So I'm Sarah Burston. I'm the project coordinator for Broadland Country Park. Thank you for the invitation to speak to you all today. Uh, it's great to be able to talk enthusiastically about the country park. And I will be encouraging you as I go through the 10 minutes, if you haven't been, to come and visit us. So it's roughly 10, 15 minutes. I'm going to introduce a bit about the country park, where it is, remind you where it is, uh, what it's there for. Um, and then there'll be time if there are any grilled or grilling questions at the end. So Leah, please, if you could start us off with the first slide. So just a quick reminder. So this was a, an early map that was discussed before the purchase. Um, what was called Howan Plantation was bought in December, 2019. So it was 57 hectares or if um, old money, 140 acres of mixed woodland and heathland and wet fen just to the north west of Norwich. So it wouldn't have been possible without the support of the Greater Norwich Growth Board. So it's been absolutely critical to get the country park off the ground. So thank you. So this in addition to 20 hectares or just under 50 acres of woodland that Broadland District Council already leased now is making up what we is now known as Broadland Country Park. So you can see from this graphic the location of the park and just some of the brilliant connections that make it a uh, a really easily accessible quality green space. So Leo, next slide, please. So I started in post as the project coordinator in August 2020. So I'm going to mostly talk about what's happened since then. One of the first things we did was to christen the park and install the welcome panel. So this is the main sign in the car park. Uh, the park is made up of former pine plantation. So it was a dense pine woodland until nine years ago, uh, mixed with broadleaf woodland and 12 hectares of sweet chestnut plantation. And now's a great time if you're into your chestnuts to come and do some chestnutting. They're all on the ground after the wind we had yesterday. And uh, we've also got sizable areas of heathland and remnant fen, which um, I'm told is almost of the quality of triple SI. So a lot of our experts are very excited about the, the fen in the middle there under where it says Winnie Hills on the map. 
Um, so Winnie Hills is the county wildlife site and it's also connected to the adjacent areas of woodland, Felthorpe Common and Drayton Drury to the south. So you can see from the map, we've got two waymarked routes, the pink 1.3 kilometer circular and the purple 2.4 kilometer. Leia, if you could pass on to the next slide, please. So one of the first, first things we did was to get in some waymarking discs and some finger posts. Here you can see on the left, the Norwich Fringe Project installing some finger posts with our own specially designed logo. Um, so it's really helpful to work closely with the rights of way officer from the county. So not only have we been able to waymark those that pink and purple route within the country park, but also took advice on signing routes into the country park, uh, which is an ongoing piece of work. So there's always more, more signage we can do. So next slide, please. Next, uh, brilliant, thank you. Um, so what I wanted to do early on was to really get some baseline data, um, or, you know, collected so we know who's using the country park how often and what they're doing so one of the first things i did was to install three sets of people counters on the main access points there from the main car park on haveringland road so you can see them there in the bottom right hand corner they're just fairly two innocuous black boxes that um, work as you pass between the boxes and they use something called Lorawan technology and I'm sure there'll be someone on the call who knows a lot more about that than me but basically it uploads every 15 minutes to um, a dashboard of data and it's clever enough to know which way people are moving so I can tell who's coming into the gate and who's coming out um, and it's given us a really, it's not entirely accurate, but a really useful set of data about numbers of people and most important, uh, most importantly, which are the busy days, which are the busy times of the day. Uh, so working out roughly about a thousand, a thousand people a week, <clears throat> excuse me. So they were installed last November. And so we've almost got 12 months worth of data. Um, important thing to remember on the counters is it's visits not visitors. So whilst they're very clever, they can't tell the difference between people. So if we've got people visiting more than once in a day or doing a circle where they pass the counters more than once, obviously it counts them twice. So that's worth bearing in mind. But I've got almost a full set of a year's data now. The other thing we've recently done is commission a consultancy called Footprint Ecology to do some in-person visitor surveys this summer which was absolutely fascinating. Uh, I'm happy to share the report if anyone's interested. So they did face-to-face -face interviews with 172 individuals and bear with me, there's some statistics coming. They saw 824 people with 430 dogs on their eight days of surveys, which were split halfway between weekends and, and weekdays. And they stood at four different points uh, four different locations so we can see where people are coming into the country park and which way they're walking and they went through a 22 question survey um, one of the obvious things people are doing is dog walking was the main activity with 76 percent of people you can see there in that pie chart giving that as the main reason they're coming 59 percent were visiting for a minimum of 30 minutes to an hour so visits uh, are, are on the short side currently 65% travelled by car or van and most followed the same or similar route they do every time. Uh, and that's all been mapped. So what we've been able to do is show a heat map of the most uh, well used routes, which is really helpful. 88% came from within the Broadland District Council area and 75% from within 5.8 kilometres. So very, very local usage currently of the country park, which is really useful to know. Um, we also collected some freeform comments and um, very, very positive and appreciative of the local green space on people's green um, doorstep. So that came through very strongly. Next slide, please, Leah. Right, enough of the statistics. Here's some, here's some pictures. So here's some images of some of the hard infrastructure we've been installing. So top left is the smaller of our two car parks, which we've had resurfaced, top dressed and re-rolled. And there top right, you can see uh, picnic benches, which are the same as the ones at Catton Park being installed with very, very, very heavy. That's why we needed to use a digger. 
Um, um, bottom left there are very new uh, picnic benches, which have only been in two weeks overlooking the Heathland, uh, an excellent place should you wish to come in the summer if you haven't to see and hear our very rare night, jar night jars who are using the Heath. We think we have three pairs this summer, which is fantastic news. And there bottom right are bike racks just to allow people to consider their sustainable travel when they come to the country park so they don't always drive. Um, the biggest piece of investment so far has been the surfacing of our pink route, so the 1.4 kilometre circular route, which I've already talked about in January this year. So Leia, if you can show us the next slide, let me just grab some water. You'll be pleased to know this is the before picture. <laughs> so on the left there, you can see what we were really struggling with, uh, lots of standing water um, and, and people were having to make detours around the path to avoid the mud and it's ca causing all sorts of problems. This used to be the main logging route into the pine plantation. So over the years has really suffered some significant wear and tear and it was really showing. So you can see there on the right, um, before the path was surfaced, we took the opportunity to improve the drainage, which was obviously gonna, gonna be crucial to keeping the path dry. So dug a new ditch there that runs parallel to the path and installed some pipes underneath the surface to allow the water to run off. Uh, and if you can show us the after picture layer, which is the next slide. So we laid down uh, geotextile around um, the whole route and then on top a layer of aggregate and then topped with granite fines. And you can see there the finished article weaving through the trees. The feedback's been really positive. We've seen uh, mobility scooters for the first time, push chairs and bikes using the path, which is exactly what we wanted. So we wanted to be able to say, you know, it's a year round, all user, mud free path. And um, so far, well, I know we've had a very dry summer. So far, it's proving to definitely be mud free. Thank you, Leah. Next slide. So in May 2021, Jules Kennelly joined me as our three day a week park ranger. And there she is top left. She's got many years of conservation experience and has come from Pensthorpe. So has got all of the brush cutter and chainsaw tickets and is much more practical than me when it comes to managing woodland. She's also brilliant at working with families and it's meant that we've been able to test our first ever on site events. So there on the right, you can see our first ever event at Easter, where we invited families to come and do um, some Easter crafts and follow an Easter egg trail of painted wooden eggs. And what was really brilliant is that we were able to use our own on-sourced uh, silver birch. So we were trying to keep it absolutely plastic free and as on message as possible when it comes to managing woodland. And you can see what fun the kids had and it was absolutely freezing. Um, the addition of a coffee van and a hired in toilet also helped people stay longer because it really was very cold. We were having to hold the gazebo up. Then we ran two more days in August in the summer holidays, making bug hotels from recycled plastic bottles. And this time we did it under the canopy of the sweet chestnut trees because it was very, very hot. Um, the kids absolutely loved it. Um, and the feedback was amazingly positive. And a lot of people, uh, very local, who didn't know the country park existed. So we're, we're having very good quality conversations with some of those families. And we're hoping to run something similar uh, involving a messy craft in October half term. So watch this space. Uh, next slide, please, Leah. Uh, this summer also saw the completion and the launch of our Sweet Chestnut Family Cycle Trails. So this was all funded by British Cycling through their Places to Ride funding scheme. So we've installed three 750 meter uh, routes through the Sweet Chestnut Plantation, and we've called them the Butterfly, Squirrel and Toadstool Trail, very definitely aiming them at families and all users. There's a very gentle gradient through the trees with some simple features called rollers and berms, just so people can uh, advance their cycling skills. The routes are all way marked, you can see there from the top right with images of butterflies, uh, toadstools or squirrels, uh, and they're one way with a rest area at the bottom end and the top end. Um, but butterfly and toadstool routes are designed for everyone and we've tested them with disability trikes and hand cycles with the Norfolk Dragons group and I even had a go as well, so it's good fun uh, as an adult I can testify. Next slide please. So Jules, as well as working 
brilliantly with all of those families and outreach events has been hard at work planning our conservation management. So you can see there are cows. We currently have 11 Shetland cows and calves grazing the heathland. They're an absolutely fabulous tool at keeping our long vegetation controlled and churning up the ground to create microhabitats for invertebrates. And if you're interested, that's Horatio on the left. Um, at the bottom left, we've improved the pond and uh, done some work on the ditches just to make sure any water we do get when it rains, we can retain, which is absolutely vital when you've got livestock on, on site. And also it means we, we're at, we can provide habitat for dragonflies and damselflies, and we've had great numbers this summer. And amazingly, despite lots of parts of the county being dry, we, we kept, OK, it was a muddy puddle, but we did retain water all summer. Um, Jules is also developing our own group of regular volunteers. You can see here two pictures of volunteers at the top, coppicing willow and bottom right, setting out the bike trails. So our regular group meet on Wednesday and Saturday mornings and they're absolutely crucial for site management. We couldn't manage without them. Since January, we've clocked up between, between all our volunteers 2,500 hours. So not an insignificant number of really crucial hard work and graft on, on the ground. Most people are local and they provide a really good link into the local communities in and around Broadland Country Park. Next slide please Leah. Here we are having our COVID secure Christmas gathering last year and of course we had to do some work first to earn our lunch so we did some scrub bashing um, and, then, and then sat and had our, our outdoor lunch. Thank you. The next slide. So an additional volunteer effort, uh, in addition to that 2,500 hours, has been the work that we've been doing with the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalist Society. And you can hear, see here at the top left, that's us uh, entering, um, apologies, emptying a malaise trap of insects. So the Norfolk and Norwich Naturalists have been out to Broadland Country Park and have divided us into 16 separate compartments, which is really important for recording wildlife and being absolutely specific about where it's found. So we've set up a three year memorandum of understanding with the organisation, uh, which is full of county recorders who are mostly retired and absolutely experts in their fields. And the, the group <clears throat> have found 1,600 species already, of which 743 are insects. So, and we've got another over a year of our three year MOU to go. So they're finding some really, really important uh, bits of wildlife. Some species that have never been seen in Norfolk before, some that don't even have English names. They're only, and I can't, I'm not gonna tell you the Latin names, but a particular um, ladybird, a tiny black ladybird that doesn't even have an English name is one example. They helped install 64 bird boxes across the site and also reptile refugia. And here you can see a slow worm in the bottom right. They're also undertaking some seasonal fixed point photography. So each of those 16 compartments, every um, four times a year, they're coming and taking a photo in each direction. And what that will allow us to do is to show progress as as we change habitat management and as the seasons change on site. Good. Now, Sarah, it's, um, we're a good five minutes after the time. I said I'd probably okay. just raise an yep. eyebrow. So can we speed up a bit? Because it's yep. quite a big I've almost there. done. Almost well done. done. Good. Um, so in fact, um, if we could move on to the next slide, uh, just and some other brilliant pictures of amazing wildlife and species we find on site. So if you haven't been, I encourage you to come and visit. Um, and then a couple of, thank you, Leah, a couple of winter pictures. So whatever the season, if you could just move on, whether it be sunny, warm or snowy or autumnal, please do come if you haven't. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I've overrun. There's no need to be, no need to apologise. We should be proud of this. Um, Happy so, to take questions, but I know I'm aware you've got a very full agenda. Yeah, no, no. Are, are there any questions? You know how to indicate. So, Steve Evans, you put your hand up. You go first. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. I just want to say, uh, Broaden Country Park is great. I love it. The kids love it. Um, the only so well done. Uh, uh, it's, it's, Thank it's, you. it's something we can be proud of. Uh, my only question was. Um, you know, I, t I tell as many people as I can about it because they don't really know it's there. So it was a question about comms, really. I know it's a, it's a new country park, but what, what can we do to get the message out? Yes, you're right. Um, a, a marketing strategy is the way to go. 
Um, we're all, always also very conscious of our limiting uh, size of car parks currently. So we are treading a line between local promotion and thinking about future developments. So absolutely, there's more promotion we can do. Thank you. And well done. Okay, so well done, uh, Sarah. I'd make a couple of points from the chair. First of all, it's nice to see Haveringland famous for something apart from axe murders. So, um, <laughs> although that's sort of sixty years you, ago you now, you can tell but... me about that story. I haven't heard that one. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, well, it was a bloody story from the nineteen sixties, but there we are. Oh. The famous Haveringland axe murders, a celebrated case. So, well done for putting Haveringland on the map in a in a, a much more uh, wholesome. Uh, and and worthy manner but also I think there's a lesson here isn't there because what we've seen here is the importance of investing a little bit in hard infrastructure as well as some soft you know management on top and I think that there's a good pattern here for the JIRAMS work that we are doing in another sphere of life in local councils all planning authorities across Norfolk trying to do the recreational uh, mitigation and avoidance and it just demonstrates that you do need to have capital expenditure on some of these uh, projects to get them going just sort of wardening or revenue funding just to sort of sort of gentle encouragement isn't enough and I think Steve you, you've made the point you know, when you've got a really good physical location that's properly designed with the right mitigation so you've got a contained car bog it just doesn't spread out everywhere you can have something you could be proud of so i know that the planning authorities across norfolk not just in greater norwich are getting together on uh green infrastructure recreation awards and mitigation strategy jirams in in the in the um jargon we're all collecting about 185 pounds per new dwelling house for new homes that have, were completed after the first of april that's going into a pot and i think that pot can be used using the broadland scheme as a template because it seems to be you know really uh, a really good example of its type sean it's in your area did you want to say a few words or we'll move on yeah thank you john um i'd just like to reiterate some of the things that you've said mm -hmm. and also sarah that the park itself is is a phenomenal place if you haven't been please do go and see it um it is well supported by local residents um it is enjoyed by the wider area not just from broadland although most of the visitors do or a number of the visitors do come from broadland but it does come from a wider area as well when i've been there myself talking with people they have come from beyond the broadland area which is good to see um i'd also just like to thank sarah and the team for putting it together in the way that it is and continually improving the the way that it's laid out and the infrastructure around it um and also you heard sarah mention the night jars there and i say so I, I went on a night safari myself and saw the night jars and it was uh, quite enthralling to see and and to hear them because they make a lot of noise um so it's unusual to see birds at night but uh, yeah that was most enjoyable so yeah it's a very very good place and i say thank you sarah for all of your work and if you could pass that on to the team as well that'd be appreciated i will thank you good stuff well done and uh comments from cj and alan uh, adding grist to that mill thank you Let's move on now. It's item number five. It's the Greater Nor Norwich Physical Activity and Sports Strategy. I sort of was half aware this was going on, but I didn't realise it was going to quite extend to about 2,000 uh, pages. Um, why are we doing this? Well, obviously, it's a good thing to try and map out um, the way sport and healthy and active lifestyles. But I do understand that we are one of the very first and few clusters, well, authorities, although we are a cluster of authorities that are working on the new Sports England template. And so with the Sports England template, that's how a lot of this infrastructure is going to be funded. So if we followed their, their pattern and there are no other people in other parts of the country to do this, we should be able to get an unfair advantage on funding uh, for the schemes that are coming forward. So that's put it in a slight context. But Simon, you've been doing this. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to the board for the opportunity to introduce the uh, physical activity and sports strategy today. Um, and it, it's um, very topical to follow uh, the Broadland Country Park because it's a perfect example of um, where uh, you know activation leads to uh, some um, phenomenal oppor opportunities for um, for those uh, local residents. Just to I, I guess put the um, 
the need for such a strategy into context and um, and some of the, the, the challenges we face uh, uh, across Norfolk. So currently for our um, children and young people, um, we have an active lives survey that runs um, each year uh, that is administered through Sport England. And uh, as it stands for, uh, for children and young people in Norfolk, 63% um, do not achieve the, um, the recommended 60 minutes of physical activity a day. And for adults, um, it's 40% of adults that don't achieve the recommended 150 minutes a week. So strategies such like uh, such as this aim to um, maximize the opportunity to um, deal with something that is an increase in challenge as we, um, it, you know, over, as you will see from the strategy over uh, the last 20 years, those statistics have only gotten worse uh, for, for a whole range of reasons. Um, so the the strategy has been commissioned and um, and overseen uh, uh, by the Sport and Physical Activity Working Group, um, which consists of um, of partners from Grid and Ar uh, from Active Norfolk, the Grid and Arch Project Team, and Leisure and Planning Officers from uh, Norwich Broadland and South Norfolk. But we we've also brought alongside strategic health partners um, who have contributed um, significantly to the work as well. So the funding for that work um, is uh, has been fifty thousand pounds from Grid and Arch Growth Board, and also match funding of fifty thousand pounds from Sport England. And um, FMG Consulting um, were appointed to lead the um, the contract uh, and uh, delivery of the um, the strategy. And the board are requested to note that the strategy was developed just as you've um, mentioned, Chair, in in accordance with the strategic outcomes planning guidance, which was uh, a, a policy a guide that was developed in two thousand and nineteen and has since become. Um, the uh, the best practice for um, focusing on the needs of communities, but also acknowledging the challenges faced in terms of resourcing physical activity infrastructure, which are clearly considerable. So the Grid and Arch Physical Activity and Sports Strategy uh, has been informed by a detailed evidence base, uh, a targeted public consultation, a broad range of stakeholder engagement, um, and that's included clubs and, um, and sporting national governing bodies. Um, I just wanted to highlight that the strategy is an overarching um, strategy for the for the three local authorities, and it's supported by numerous constituent um, uh, documents uh, within a build facilities um, strategy for each authority and a plan pitch strategy for each as well. So very very much place based. Um, in accepting this strategy, uh, authorities and system partners have strong evidence base for future decisions. Ensuring health, well-being, and quality of life of our residents is prioritised by maximising the opportunity for active lifestyles. And the plan uh, highlights the the potential of physical activity to connect into wider objectives and outcomes. Um, so they're therefore also supporting community cohesion and economic development. Um, we have uh, an online soft launch uh, planned, and the board are requested to consider whether an in-person event should also be arranged. So I'd like to hand over to um, Damien Adams now, the lead consultant from FMG, and he will provide us with an overview of the physical activity and support strategy. Damien. Thanks, Hi, Damien. Good. Welcome. Welcome to you. Um, I'm conscious look, that, that there are so many different angles on this. And um, so it's 1432. So if you go beyond 1450, so or 52, I'll, I'll probably just raise an eyebrow. But yeah, let's have, let's have 20 minutes and just show the depth of what you've done. OK, well, we've only prepared probably about six slides because we thought time was quite limited. So that will be plenty of time, hopefully, for discussion because that, those slides should be five, 10 minutes max. Um, I don't know, somebody's centrally there going to be sharing the slides or, or, or do I do that myself? Oh, there we go. Someone's coming up. Fantastic. OK, next slide, please. Excellent. OK, here we go. So first of all, I just wanted to set out because as, as people have said, there are a lot of documents here and there are a lot of pages. So I just want to set out a bit of the structure, what's in them so that people understand all the work that's gone into it and actually uh, what the outputs are. Um, so the key output, which we're going to take you through today, is a greater knowledge, physical activity and sports strategy. So that is all about how we can get people more active and moving more, using sport, but not just sport, in their everyday lives, et cetera. Now, alongside that, you'll see coming out of that box to the right there, there is a detailed action plan, which is also 
associated associated with it and includes a number of different actions for each each area that we, we want to address and we'll come on to that later um, but it's important to note that beneath that there's been a lot of work going into two things really something called a built facilities strategy and something called a playing pitch strategy now the built facilities strategy as it says on the tin, I suppose, it is built facilities, whether they're leisure centres or whatever they might be, where people can take part in sports and physical activity. And there are assessments of need for that. So we work out what people need in terms of facilities. And then there's a strategy and action plan that comes out of that. And then on the, by the same count, there's a playing pitch strategy, which has an assessment of need, working out how many pitches we need, whether they're grass pitches, artificial pitches, etc. And then we produced a strategy and action plan beneath that. Now, all of those are kind of evidence-based documents, I would call them. They contain a lot of actions, but everything is funneled up into the top overarching document of the, the physical activity and sports strategy, where we're, it brings everything together. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so first of all, what we're going to take you through, through here, if you've, seen the, if you've seen the document, the pass, is it, just a strategy on a page, really. So it's five or six slides where we, we take you through the key bits of the strategy. Um, now, this is our mission, uh, and when I say our mission, this has been agreed, agreed with the working group, so as input, has had input from all of the representatives of the local authorities, et cetera, and Active Norfolk. So it's it, it's a joint mission where, as it says there, we're work, we want to work with a range of partners to address reasons for inactivity by supporting the development of facilities and encouraging active lifestyle behaviours. And that's quite an important point of this. Actually, some of this will be about facilities because it has to be, but actually, there'll be a wide range of your population who are never really going to use some of these formal facilities. And actually, how do we get them more active in their everyday lives? How do we encourage that so that inactive people perhaps walk more, cycle more, and are just generally more active? And that, that, that's really key to this. Next slide, please. Um, so beneath that, we set out a vision, uh, and again, agreed with the working group, um, where we're looking to enhance the health, well-being, and quality of life of our residents by creating opportunities for all and inspiring people to become more active. Um, the outcomes associated with that that we, we're looking to hopefully achieve is through implementing our plan, people will be healthier, happier, more active, um, reduced inequalities because there's a lot of research and we'll come on to it around people perhaps in more deprived areas have less opportunity to actually be more active and are as a result more less active. Um, and increase sustainability. So that's about kind of sustainability of perhaps new facilities, but also sustainability in terms of can we encourage people more to, to walk and to cycle rather than perhaps to get into their cars for a, for a short journey. So they're the kind of key outcomes we're looking to deliver uh, alongside the vision. Next slide, please. So then we set, set some objectives, which delves a bit more into, into detail exactly what we're looking to achieve. So. Um, the first one, working from left to right, is around reducing inequities in our communities, and that very much comes back to that, that research, as I said, that actually people who live in certain areas and more deprived areas are often less active, uh, and how can, we, how can we address that? Also, perhaps people of certain demographic types in, or in terms of their sex or their race might be more or less active. And actually we look at how can we how can we help some people who are less active and some communities who are less active to be more active. Um, the next one is supporting and encouraging people to live active and healthy lives. Um, then we're talking about the next one is enhancing residents' mental and physical well-being. It's uh, quite a key point to make, I think, that actually there's a lot of evidence that shows that physical activity has a really massive impact on how people feel and their mental well-being, as well as perhaps some more traditional things of physical well-being and healthy weight, etc. I think that's a really important thing we need to consider. Reducing our impact on the environment, we touched on that, but you know, the more we can get people active uh, out of their cars and walking and cycling, the better. Um, and, and equally, if we are developing new assets in the future, we can replace older assets that are less environmentally friendly, hopefully with newer assets that are that's more environmentally friendly. Um, tackling social isolation is quite a key priority as well. Um, people in rural areas, perhaps more elderly people, there can be big issues around social isolation. Um, and a lot of these people perhaps might not be as active. So actually, how can we use physical activity to bring people together in a community to actually address some of those social isolation issues um, and help them do that through physical activity. 
Uh, the next objective is supporting a strong and sustainable sector. So that, that, that's really important. We, what we want to do is make sure that, um, that there's a whole physical activity and sports sector out there that can help us deliver this. This is not just about the local authorities delivering all of this, but there are a lot of volunteers out there. There are a lot of clubs out there where people give up their time. There are a lot of charities out there doing good work. And actually, how can we work with them and also help them to, to, to be sustainable organisations and, and, and then, in turn, to deliver the sorts of activities that will help get people more active. And the final one is supporting the recovery from COVID-19. Again, I think we're all familiar with some of the challenges around, uh, around health coming out of that uh, and actually how can we use physical activity to, to address some of the health challenges that we're talking about. Next slide, please. So our strategy then sets out four what we're calling guiding principles. So it's the guiding principles behind all of our work, really. So the first one is really key, and Simon mentioned it earlier, that it's all about local places and local people. Um, there's no point just having a global, we'll do this one thing and it will address all, all of the population and it will get to all the different parts of the districts, etc. because it won't. You have to really look at your local areas and understand what are the barriers to physical activity in those local areas, what are people telling you, why are they not active, and actually what can we do about that in the local area. Um, so it won't just be about a global solution, there'll be, there'll be lots of hopefully specific local solutions really tailored by what local people are telling us. And the consultation was a really massive part of that, again Simon touched on that earlier, but we had the highest response level we've ever had to a public consultation. Um, which is really, really, really positive um, and really strengthens our strategy in terms of what people are telling us, uh, why they're not active and what could perhaps help them to be more active. So the next guiding principle is around addressing inequities. We've talked a bit about this already, so it's really about making sure that everybody, no matter their life circumstances, their, you know, no matter where they're born or who they are or where they live, has the same opportunities to be active. Um, and if we can do that, then hopefully we can kind of address some of these real issues of perhaps more deprived areas, being more inactive and by knock on impact, having more health issues, etc. So what we want to do is kind of level that playing field up and, and really address some of those inequities. The third one is about action throughout people's lives. So what we need to recognise is people's physical activity habits change as they, as they grow from being children to school into university perhaps into jobs being parents and then into as they get older um, people aren't doing that that same activity the whole way through their life their physical abilities change and things change they have different amounts of time different amounts of disposable income etc so what we're trying to say here is we need to really be looking at that life course and thinking right how can these different groups what do they need that would help them be more active um, especially when you're thinking about perhaps that more elderly people as well um, just putting on certain physical activities in a leisure centre might not be that accessible to some people. And the fourth and final guiding principle is around collaboration. Now, this is really, really, really important because we understand that local authorities have limited budgets and actually we can't deliver all of this by ourselves. And it links back to the point on the previous slide where we're saying about working with the sector. So how can we work with different different partners, different organisations out there? How can we work with residents themselves? How can we, we work with volunteers? How can we make sure that everybody is pulling together and working and moving in the same direction? They understand our vision and, they, and they're bought into it and hopefully providing activities that can help us achieve it. Next slide, please. Okay, this is the final slide. Um, there's a lot of detail behind this, but just for time constraints, we're just gonna to touch on the very headline of, the, of these areas. We identified eight different areas for what you could call programmes or work areas where there's going to be separate actions or there are separate actions, separate action plans, and there'll be working groups looking at how those these are delivered. So very briefly, I'll touch on each of them. Um, the first one is active environments. So that's about environments where people can be more active. So it might be built facilities, but it might not necessarily be. It could be in their neighbourhoods, in their homes, uh, wherever they are. The next one is around active systems. So what we're saying there is, how can we influence systems, uh, policy and decision makers to actually incorporate physical activity at, at its heart? So good examples of things like the planning system and the health system, et cetera. Um, how can we really get physical activity as a core part of that and working with partners to achieve that? Um, active health is the third one. So we know that physical activity is a massive preventative tool uh, in terms of preventing ill health. 
and we really need to enshrine that as part of the health system in effect so that actually physical activity is where people are perhaps turning to address some issues before they become really chronic problems and how do we work with health partners better to embed physical activity in that system the fourth area is active travel so i think that's fairly obvious one in effect i suppose it's really about how do we get people to move more in ways that perhaps aren't sitting in cars so actually do we get them to walk do we get them on their scooters do we get them to cycle um, how can we encourage people more to move around in an active way? Uh, active workplaces, working with employers and workplaces, and indeed looking inwards to our own workplaces and in, in the free local authorities to say, how can we facilitate and encourage our employees to live active lives? Um, uh, and perhaps we can do that in different ways around exercise initiatives, or perhaps it might be as simple as stand-up desks so that people aren't sitting down all day. There's lots of different ideas and ways in which you can do that. The SIP area is active education. Um, and again, that one, as it says on the tin, is around working with education sector, so schools, universities primarily, to actually say, how can you, or how can we work with you perhaps to ensure that your students, your pupils have access to physical activity and, and, and are making the most of that access and perhaps providing pathways out of education into, into the sector in terms of jobs, but also into sports so that people continue to take part in playing clubs and into different groups and activities so that people take their activity and their education and then move out into their day-to-day -day lives and are still active. Uh, workforce development is the seventh area so that is really about that point again about working with the sector it's not just our own workforce it's about everybody's workforce there's lots of volunteers out there so how can we help support people in terms of their upskilling um, and the final final area is raising awareness, which is really, really, really important. Lots of people through the consultation were saying, actually, in that public survey, I don't really know where to go to do this. I don't know where and how I can get active. So it's about one, raising awareness of our, of our priorities and what we're trying to do, but then two, raising awareness of you know, the kind of schemes out there, the initiatives out there, the facilities out there, the programs out there, the parks over that out there, the open spaces that people can use to be active and making sure people understand Oh, actually, I don't need to go and pay and use a leisure centre potentially. I can just walk to that park down the road or that great new country park you showed earlier and be active within that space. And I think that is that is the end of our presentation. So I'll take any questions. OK, well, let's take ourselves off mute. That's fantastic. Good. So that's a really comprehensive plan. In my opening remarks, Damien, I mentioned the fact that this is sort of one of the very first such plans that is a called in accordance with the, the, the new Sport England guidance. Do you want to explain what opportunities there might be for us now we've got this piece of work? And I'm sort of partly minded by the next item on the agenda, which lists out all the infrastructure plans we've got. How, how, how do we use this? We've got it. How do yeah. we now use it? Yeah, so it follows, as Simon mentioned, the Strategic Outcomes Planning Guidance, SOPG, a bit of a mouthful, but it's Sport England's kind of standard approach to how everybody in an ideal world should consider their, their, their outcomes that they want to achieve before they work out what assets they need. People often jump to, oh, we need a leisure centre, but they haven't considered what we're trying to achieve, how do we do that, where is it best place to sit, what do we need, do we need a leisure centre, then follows from that. So we followed that approach and that, that it is, a, although it's been around a couple of years, it's been kind of slow to take hold, if I'm honest. So actually, you're right, we are one of the first early adopters of it, and certainly in terms of three local authorities together, I haven't seen anybody doing that. So the scale of it is, is pretty unprecedented, I think. In terms of opportunities, if you're talking specifically about funding, um, it's kind of a timely one in a way, but not one that I can answer definitively, because Sport England are currently, they have a new strategy, but they have not revised their funding plans around that. So within, hopefully, very soon, we are expecting them to come out with an, a raft of new funding uh, opportunities linked to um, how to get people more active. So our, our strategy, your strategy, is very much linked to Sport England's strategy, as you would expect as well. So, so, so what that means is it will put you in the best position possible to be to be um, to be best able, I think, to access those funding streams when they are announced, because they're they're kind of moving away from the bit about traditional sport leisure facilities. That's still there, but their real focus is on physical activity, getting people moving, um, and that's exactly what you're trying to do here. Um, and so, certainly through this document, Sport England have signed it off. I think we're certainly well placed once they announce those funding streams to have a good opportunity. 
Okay. Right. So we've got um, Andrew first, then Sean. Over to you guys. Well, thanks, Simon. It was just a point, really, in what you said, uh, David, in the presentation about active environments, because it sort of you know, resonated with me to a certain extent. Well, I live in Brundle, which is outside Brundle, and uh, we've got a new 3G pitch going in there. But also there's um, a lot of much more commentary around more informal space. I'm just interested to hear what people have said to you when you're speaking to various people, various groups and so forth, what the balance is, you know, whether it's more towards informal um, availability or form. So certainly in terms of the, the consultation when you're talking about speaking to the public, it, it was more around, I suppose, what I would call informal. So it's actually their, their, their physical activity, habits and potentials around walking, running, um, activities like that, going to parks, as you say, rather than necessarily um, perhaps team sports um, and formal physical activity, uh, sports facilities. Now, they obviously have a key role to play because they're very important and we need them. But, you know, only probably around 16% of the country are, are members of a gym. And that's been fairly standard for absolutely years, give or take the odd percentage here or there. So actually, that 16% of the country who, who will use a gym, but the, the other percentage, they, they're they not interested in joining a gym, it seems. So actually, how do we get them to be more active? And that's where the informal spaces are absolutely key to this. Some people are put off by the sports facilities as well in terms of it's an intimidating environment to some people, especially if they've never been physically active. So, so, so what do they need in terms of the first step? They might need, you know, a, a friendly group to go for a walk with in the local park. You know, it might be the very first step into physical activity. And that's where informal spaces come in. I think especially important is informal spaces in design of new housing developments as well. Really, really important that we're we're making space for play um, and we're making space for people to be physically active in kind of safe and welcoming environments as well. Good. Uh, Sean? Thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you, Simon. Thank you, Damien, for the presentation. That was very informative, um, taking us through that. Um, I must apologise. I haven't had a chance to go through the entire document because it is quite large, but... I was pleased to see that there were the four and a half thousand residents that responded, as you said in your presentation, that's a that's a large number of people to have uh, had their say. So that, that's very encouraging to see. Um, one thing I can't see in the strategy, and, and I've tried to find it in the how we will deliver the strategy, is, is the implementation cost. Has any of that been identified? And do we need to set a budget? Do, do, do we know what it is around this that we're, we're delivering? Because I see in the action plan, in Appendix C, it has a whole host of actions, but there, there's no costs identified that I can see. And I just wondered if that's yet to happen or just I'd say hasn't been done yet. It wasn't, it wasn't part of our scope in terms of developing a cost for each of the items. So I, I, I would assume, and, and Grace and Simon might come in here, but there are, there's going to be a working group that's going to look at each of those actions that we talk about. And I would assume they will start to then look at those and cost those up and prioritise those. Uh, in terms of a timeline over the coming years. Um, but no, it hasn't been done so far. Okay, so that'll uh, be part uh, of the next stage of the piece of work, I assume then. It, it, it's certainly part of the um, work of the Sport and Physical Activity Working Group, who will be um, continuing to um, uh, oversee the implementation of the, the work. Uh, the action plans ultimately form um, a, a, a list of um, recommendations and, and opportunities for each local authority to prioritize because clearly um, some of the um, actions within them at, at a certain point in time may be cost prohibitive. Um, so we, we acknowledge that uh, one of the um, parts of the papers are, are funding options, some of those national, some regional, um, that are ways in which the working group and other system partners can connect into um, external opportunities for uh, for match and support funding um but certainly not a detailed um costing or funding plan for for this implementation yeah. as yet yeah and i'd probably endorse that no there's a it's a great inventory of what we've got and a good exploration of what we could have i mean my my only observation having looked natural as you might expect on the bits of south norfolk is that when thinking about swimming provision just for grins, and because it's because the cookie cutter or the, or the extent has been kept so tightly to um, the South Norfolk boundary, 
very little consideration was given to the one just over the border at Bungie or the one at the uh, the football ground at Carrow Road or even the UEA, which are both in the city area. So, you know, but that, that, that's not intended to be criticism. I think it's just a, we need to use what we've got and then read it to see it in the round. It's still a good inventory, but it, it's what you haven't done, as you just said, I think is sort of said, give a plan, a detailed plan for each authority because those cross border effects need to be taken into account. So it's, like I said, it's a good inventory and uh, some good food for thought there and an evidence base that's in the it's Sport England format and ultimately funding is more likely to come from Sport England at the moment than our own coffers. So that's, you know, uh, that's going to put us in the best possible position. Okay, so yeah. I'm not seeing any other comments. Is anyone I can't stand. Yes. Yes. Oh, go on. John, can I just come back on that? Sorry, very quickly. Yeah, please, yeah. I don't normally use this Zoom and I couldn't work out to put my hand up. So um, just on the cross-border boundary thing, in terms of the supply and demand that informs the statistics of what is required, um, Sport England's modelling does take into account what is happening in the local authorities surrounding. Mm. Um, so if it's saying there is demand for X facility, a swimming pool, it has taken into account things that are in surrounding authorities as well, even though we haven't then probably specifically reference those in the strategy that they're, they're, they're factored into the calculations. Okay, that's great. Okay, well, we've exhausted that one. It's 14.55, so we sort of kept the time as well, which is even better. Fantastic. Good. Thank you for your attendance, Simon and Damien. That was, that was, that was great. So I think from the chair, I'd say that the last two um, presentations have been pretty good, actually, and, and demonstrate you know, what the GNGB is for. We take the sill. And uh, we try and use that as best we can to address the cumulative impacts of growth. Growth is on everyone's lips at the moment. The Prime Minister's speech yesterday was saying growth, growth, growth. But we don't just spend our own sill that's generated from developers. We try and you know, fold in other money as well. And, it, and, you know, and the outcome is either better health outcomes, we've just seen, or better environmental outcomes. It isn't just about the hard infrastructure of roads and everything else. And that leads us nicely, doesn't it, uh, Phil, into agenda item number six, which sorry, is looking... Sorry, Chair, can ah. I just, sorry to interrupt, can I just ask, have you agreed the recommendations for the oh, last sorry. item? They're on page 11. Oh, well done, Claire. Uh, are we happy to uh, agree the recommendations, including, thank you for reminding me, uh, the suggestion that we have an in-person launch, I think in-person. You know, sport is a team, team sort of thing, gets teams together. Happy with that. So recommendations, I'll accept the report and go for in person. I think it would be my preference, but is that accepted by everyone else? Yeah, agree from my point of view. And actually, being as you just chipped in there, perhaps the nest would be, which is an exemplar uh, of the sort of things getting people going, might be a good location. Oh, excellent. I'm sure they'd love that. Well, there we are. That's killed all the birds who one stone. Fantastic. I'd agree, I'd agree with that as well, Chairman. Good. Perfect. Right. Let's now, so I think Alan put his hand up too. So that's fantastic. Right. Let's go on to page 59 now of the PDF um, papers, uh, which is Phil. We've lined you up, really. Because yeah, when, we, when, we, when we met last time, I think we've got this program, a, a, a list of potential projects that seem to have grown year after year. And in fact, once something had got on the, on the, the program, it never seemed to fall off. And that, well, that's not realistic. And so I think we asked for everything on there that had been put on over the years and carried forward to be revalidated. And we've now got a series of appendices, which I think are really good. Because first of all, we start to see, you know, what projects are there, um, what the cost might be, what actually these projects are trying to do. Because I think some of the things on the list had sort of had shorthand titles and, well, nobody really knew what it was on there or somebody proposing it might have left the employment years ago. So... Here's a good startup at 10. I think the work isn't complete, but it's a great path along the way. I know, isn't it? And Grace has done a lot of work on this. So, you know, what's the status? And I think it's going to help us really focus on stuff that is really risk to take forward. And just so, um, Phil, you've worked with Grace on this. Did you? And Grace, turn your camera on. You can chip in as well. But Phil, why don't you go first? Yeah, John, I'm not. I'm really not going to overplay my part. I can take no credit for it. I'm simply just um, 
I'm just the person that's presenting it. Uh, Grace and, and Tom in particular have done a, a vast amount of work on this. And I think actually the, the comment, the constructive criticism that happened in June, I think was fair. There was a lot of to be, um, you know, to be confirmed and lots of gaps. The team have worked really hard on this, pulled it together. Uh, it's self-explanatory. Uh, G and GB are recommended to accept now these draft appendices, having seen the main body uh, in June. Again, you can see the changes that have been made in section two of the report. Uh, you've also said, look, we recognise the GNIP has changed over the years and it will continue to change and there will be ongoing improvements year on year because that's what the team is striving to do. Just as one point of um, to note on page, I think it's 64, Hartsey's uh, junction is still um, noted as BDC, as Broadland, whereas actually it's Norwich City. But other than that, uh, the recommendation in the report is before you. Yeah, Grace, you just want to explain how much time and effort has been put into this, because it looks, you know, as if, oh, what's going on there? But I mean, actually getting us a description for each project has been a non-trivial exercise. Well, it's been so much time that actually I didn't do it on this occasion. <laughs> and I have to say that Tom within our team has put, basically it was his, his it was handed over to him completely and it took him all summer to put this together. You know, and it's work that we've wanted to do for a number of years. Um, it's work that we've known was there, but um, it's always difficult to find the time. But we are pleased that we've made this sort of next, this improvement. So it's not, the final is not exactly where we want it to be, but it's it's, it's in, an improvement in regards to the main differences. It's got those two different appendices now with some kind of entrant um, sort of eligibility criteria. So projects that are in Appendix A, we have got full information about anything else is sort of put within Appendix B. So we, it continues to report the uh, collection of all infrastructure that would be required to support growth if we had unlimited resource we could deliver everything but we can't but it now is moving further towards trying to actually draw out those ones that are strategic priorities and it's that sort of stepping stone so we can actually demonstrate it um, you know the the root of uh, the prioritization of projects so anything within a program or has got someone progressing it is in appendix a everything else mm. the aspirational ones are further down so but we are, we have got an attention to move to more digital um version of the gene next year um so it will look different again as as um phil has already said and yes sorry to councillor fuller for not making that minor <laughs> that amendment we were very <laughs> frustrated um that we, we were aware that it was picked up at the last meeting i'm really sorry that it wasn't changed on this occasion and it has been done now yeah, don't worry. Look, in summary, <laughs> on page on page uh, sixty three of the PDF, there's a, you know everything that follows on represents about a third of a billion pounds worth of infrastructure. I mean, this is serious wage, and the man in the street who uh, has expectations of infrastructure being delivered, the developer who's paying for the sill, you know, are all and everybody else in between are entitled to know, you know, where is the money that is either being raised or spent being spent on and I think for at the moment to have got the project status listed into approved feasibility aspirational it is a huge benefit in, or, or improvement in clarity so we can sort of really see where where we are now and I think I'm, I've no hesitation in recommending this to colleagues to be uh, approved here and now but I do think you've touched on going forward there is a huge amount of public interest in this uh, I think it would be very good to find out who the accountable person or team is for each of them. So that if a man in the street or a member of the public wants to, or even a woman on the bus, you know, wants to know, you know, I'm interested in this project, who do I speak to? Or a grant making body thinking, well, we've got some money we could apply to this sort of thing. It's much more interactive, slice and dice, uh, I think would, would be a big improvement. I mean, this is the sort of thing for which Google Sheets was invented, you know, publish a, a spreadsheet in a read-only, but you can sort and dice. And I think that would, 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 would be good. Who else wants to have a go? Are we all just happy this, we, we have sort of got three quarters of the way along the way? Alan, you look as if you're trying to say something. Yes, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a remarkable achievement, actually. It's a, a really very thorough piece of work and it's a very good, sort of reference document for uh, councillors, uh, for leaders, 
actually, you know, picking up issues that, you know, some ward councillors may have some interest or parish or town councillors interest in or speaking on behalf of uh, public. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's to be celebrated. I mean, it is the, uh, it is the driving, you know, force through the partnership that we forged together. Um, you know, everything we, actually everything we do through the Greater Norwich um, Partnership Board and, you know, the first two items today. And then this, you know, this is, this is sort of spreading resource right across the area. Uh, everybody's got a stake. Everybody's got some opportunity to see improvements in their local communities over time. So um, no wonder we are, we are rightly celebrated in other parts of the country for the partnership that we forged together all those years ago. Good. Um, Sean, come on. Yeah, thank you, Chairman. Uh, and again, thank you for the team for updating this on from where we were before. Um, I just got a few questions around some of the content really around some of the summaries and things. So I guess the first big question I heard is why isn't the Western Link on it? I was a bit surprised um, not to see that in the transport policies. Um, and also some of the categories don't seem to line up in the way I expected them to. So for example, under community, it lists four projects, but when you go to the community um, element, it only has two on the list same with education there's 13 listed sorry there's 14 listed but it says there's 13 um uh, again it's just trying to understand perhaps why there's some anomalies or why things don't quite match up um also then when you sort of go into the detail um we've got and, and i do agree with the chairman where he's asking for more identification of the project owners because that's going to be really useful um, but we've got some projects that are under construction, but they've got no secured funding, which I find a bit bizarre, or, or even to be confirmed as titles or zeros. Uh, I, I don't understand how we can have stuff under construction if it's still to be confirmed where the funding's coming from. Um, so th things like that just look a bit strange. Um, and it's also then just trying to understand again, the, the entire scope of this piece of work, is this trying to list every single piece of community infrastructure funding that is spent? Um, because uh, again, an element of this is, as, as Alan alluded to, is relates to us understanding our own activity as the growth board and therefore back to the budget element of that. Um, and within this, I couldn't see how that mar married across or, um, to cross-reference against that. So I'm not quite sure of all of these activities, which ones we are funding directly through the growth board um, and which ones come from other places as such. Um, so I'll pause there before I carry on, see if we can get some answers to some of those things. Go on, Grace, or Phil. Okay. I probably should come. So I suppose I should sort of rewind to remind people what the Greater Knowledge Infrastructure Plan is intending to do. It's actually not intending to recommend um, any spend. It's actually just an overarching collection summary of what is required across all thematics. Um, so it is a document that um, needs some tidying up. I know, you know, and it needs some um, sort of confirming. Um, but in regards to which projects are included and the detail of the projects that are included, we as a team are provided with all the information that's in it by all the district officers and all the county officers. If there is information that is incorrect, I'm afraid that is the information that's been provided to us. Um, we, when we move on next year, um, we are going to hopefully be able to spend some more time interrogating the information we can't do that with every single one um and but it means that we will make sure that if we actually implement some kind of acceptance sort of eligibility criteria for the for the appendix a we will make sure that the ones that are prioritized and are brought to the fore are clear that you have, we do have a full understanding of how it's funded where the funding is coming from but it's this is all funding, all funding streams. Seal is only a minute part of what is actually funding 
what is actually put forward within this this um, plan is not to pretend into or even trying to sort of demonstrate that SIL is actually delivering it. It's actually trying to demonstrate the complete opposite to say that SIL is never going to be able to, to deliver everything. Therefore, we need to be looking at all the different income streams. If there are issues with the numbers tallied up, that we, need, we need to check that, that maybe just because of the the speed of the, the or the short time frame that we've had to put this through so we can check those things and um uh Kat Vincent you know we can be in touch directly if there's some, you know maybe to, to sort of confirm I might ask um Tom to contact you directly just to sort of clarify that your your the things that you have picked up so that we can consider that when we do the next iteration the question about Norwich Western Link is within the text of the document so because the, these are just the appendices so an update was provided but I don't know why it's not in the appendices um, it's um, it hasn't been provided to us as a project so and we haven't noticed that it's not actually included so um, it's something that we can pick up again at the next iteration. Yeah well done Sean action man with eagle eyes you've spotted a big hole there but yeah well done look I think what I'd say is when we reviewed this in June uh, and we, we, we did agree to it subject in June, subject to you know, these enhancements, there were 1,088 TBCs in the plan. There are now 21. So I think you know to have to have knocked down nearly 1,050 TBCs and to clarify them you know, has been a non-trivial exercise. I do think we need to know who the owners are when we when we look at this back in next June 23 and possibly identify some of the sources of funding. To your point, is it SIL, Section 106, Sport England, uh, aping the previous item on the agenda? So this is very much a direction of travel, but let's celebrate, if I may, just for the moment, I'll come to you in a moment, Matt, the fact that we have really fisked hundreds of lines to get down to about 125, what you might call core projects. And some of the fluff that has frankly just got carried forward year after year without anyone even questioning it has fallen away. And, and I think that's the first step along the path. Matt, presumably you're wanting to come in on the Western Link point, are you? Or are, are, you, are you happy it's all done? Thank you, Chair. I, I was a couple of points, I guess, in relation to that. I, iterate everything that's been said in terms of a far more disciplined approach to the creation of this infrastructure list. I guess the point I was going to make, and it partly answers Councillor Vincent's question, um, this isn't the only infrastructure plan out there. There is the Norfolk Strategic Infrastructure Delivery Plan. Uh, that is county-wide uh, uh, and, again, uh, is compiled by all the local authorities in Norfolk. And I think you'll find that there's an element of cross-reference. So we'll take that point away. Um, but certainly, you know, Western Link, uh, a number of other key projects in terms of infrastructure funded through different means, um, primarily, I guess, in terms of those transport schemes through uh, DFT, through the large local majors and the major road network for example um, their, their funding is uh, is determined in a different way doesn't fully answer the question that Sean's raised we'll take that away and we'll provide a, a full answer and it may well be that for, for next year's uh, new and improved version that's even better than this year's um, we'll have some, um, some, some some fuller answers and um, uh, we'll address those points. Well, fuller answers are always good, of course. Um, okay, <laughs> that's fine. Okay, so look, we're we're on a path there. I think we've we've sealed we all we had already sealed in this uh, infrastructure plan. We've just now got uh, it's significantly better enumerated. Oh, sh oh, Graham, you've come in. Let's go on, and then we'll move on. I, I did. I just wanted to add a point around the the comments around the Western Link in there and its treatment it is mentioned there's a, there's effectively an update that is given in the um in these we're looking at the appendices to the GNIP. it's mentioned and the status of it is referred to in the GNIP itself as a factual update because it's a major scheme but the purpose of the GNIP was to identify the infrastructure that was designed to support the city deal and the joint core strategy and effectively the shared growth plan that the districts and the county have already agreed and are moving to implement. Of course, it is, the, the Western Link isn't required for that purpose. Um, and there is still a difference of opinion about the scheme itself, which is why um, 
there isn't unanimity about whether the Western Link should be built between all the constituent authorities. So it wouldn't normally be appropriate to refer to it unless we were all at least content with the principle of the scheme going in there. So I don't think it's going to necessarily appear anything other than a factual update. And this is being promoted for the following reasons uh, within any future iteration of the GNIP as things stand. Hmm, okay. In the previous item, we used the term inventory to record all the possibilities of um, you know, sport in the area. But I do think that, you know, 10 years into the city, past the city deal signing, there is an evolutionary approach here. And I, I certainly, it was my expectation, and I think it was yours, and Sean implied in what comments you said, that this is moving beyond just the delivery of city deal outcomes. This is an inventory of what's needed to support not just growth, the cumulative impacts of those, but address environmental health, transport and education improvements. And if, if we have arbitrarily constrained ourselves, that it's only stuff that you know, we thought we were going to do back in 2012, then a, a new approach, I would suggest, is needed, a more, more sort of comprehensive inventory we identify the people who are taking these things forward because if, if it turns out something isn't needed well let's get it off because there's plenty of stuff there that is needed and we're only limited amount of um money sean come on let's let's draw some sense around this yeah thank thank you chairman a, a little surprised by um graham's comment because there's a whole host of stuff in here that isn't part of the joint core strategy or the delivery plan as was there are things in here that support the new local plan delivery and there are things that are never mentioned in the new local plan or the old joint core strategy um for nothing you know just just to highlight all the things that have been brought forward out of the neighborhood plans there none of those have been agreed by the three councils the four councils around the delivery or, or their support of those but those are deliveries and aspirations for local communities and things that they want done and are planning to do. So I think my understanding of this plan and the scope of it was that it captured, and I think you you mentioned it as well, Chairman, we captured everything that was going on and, and was attempting to be delivered. And if that's what it is, then that's what it is. And if, if we don't all agree what's on there is correct to be delivered, well, some of that I believe is beyond our choices that's for others to make those choices if i've understood the scope of this correctly i'll stop there you're right and based on following your lead from the from the western link text i have just done a text search for long stratton bypass and that isn't there either well that was certainly part of the city deal so uh, grace would probably <laughs> you've got to try well look this is like painting the fourth road bridge uh, I'm going to try to draw these strands together here. Let's celebrate the improvements to be made. Knocking it down from 1,088 to BCs, TBCs down to 21. But you know, I, I think we've got an aspiration. But by this time, by the time this comes to the board next time in June, a significantly more comprehensive list or you know, an inventory of what's needed you know, in, included potentially, even if there isn't absolute unanimity. Because remember, a lot of this stuff is aspirational feas feasibility. So you know, the fact that not everyone's agreed doesn't necessarily mean it isn't an aspiration for some people. And yeah, certainly the long run bypass needs to be in there uh, as well. So, um, and accountable people. Well done, Grace. And Tom, thank you for your diligent work over the summer. Um, I think uh, colleagues who are responsible for some of these projects Point just now need to put names or certainly teams next to it so the man on the street can see who who to speak to and who, who um, members of the press can inquire so we've got some accountability there and then i think we'll go forward but well i think it's a good thing phil you've brought this paper we've had a good knockabout around it what do you reckon no i think you've had a good knockabout i think the praise has been given to the team as quite sh well should be um i don't want to prolong the debate much longer but you've already pointed to uh, the top of or the the top of the appendices which gives the list as those that are eligible to receive SIL funding hmm. now Longstrat and Bypass was explicitly referred to in the city deal as ring fencing hmm. 10 million pounds we'll come on to that shortly and Western Bypass also is receiving funding from elsewhere 
So I can see why they're in the main body of the report, which isn't before us today. They're in the June report and they were absolutely mm. explicitly referred to in that report. And this is an appendices that for projects that are eligible to self funding. So I'm still, look, you, you, I think, yeah, the request, the recommendation is you accept these appendices. It no, sounds like you're in a good place to be able to do that. Everyone is saying the same thing, that this is an, a, an ongoing evolutionary thing and will continue to improve. The team have heard the comments, let them go away and continue to make those improvements. Good, brilliant. Good progress. Let's move towards a comprehensive inventory. And on that basis, let's move on. Right, I'm now turned on to page 135 of the printed papers, which is agenda item seven. And this is to do with schools capital program. Now, um, when this, astonishingly, when the SIL was first created, and I think it's only Andrew and myself probably can remember that now, back in the midst of time, um, a certain director at the county hall connived to make sure that education wasn't even in the SIL list, couldn't believe it. So no one is more pleased than me um, sees, you know, we've been able to get funding for schools, because if schools aren't part of infrastructure, what is? You, know, you have to ask that simple question. And we've been funding two million a year for a number of projects, but this proposal's come forward, which by my reading of the papers, um, makes that two million pound leverage a further 80. And there's a huge list of sco schools here, which all need to be built. So uh, difficult to argue against all this, but Sam, you look as if you're trying to say a few words. Did you want to come in? Have I said what you wanted to hear? I don't know, over to you. You're on mute. You, I thought you might have learned that by now. Or is your mic? No, you're off mute, but your microphone's not working. We can go to Isabel if you want. Isabel, well, do you want to hold the thought while Sam plugs in her microphone? Um, I, can you hear me? Can I can hear, hear me you. Okay? Oh, because we have had a problem sometimes, um, Sam. I don't know whether you need to come out. Turn and off and on again. again. Just turn yeah, off and on we, again. We do, some of our laptops aren't very compatible with Zoom. Um, it has been a problem for us. Obviously, we tend to use Teams, so I do, I do apologise. Um, so you've got the report in front of you, and I believe that Sam has emailed just a very brief summary on, on a couple of slides, which just recaps um, where we are um, with this report and the recommendations that we're asking for. Um, the first thing to say is that um, just to say that we are very grateful to the way that the GNGB board has agreed to support the statutory duty with, with the £2 million a year, and you should have received um, ongoing um, reports of how we've been spending it. And that and that work continues. Um, I don't know, um, uh, Leah, whether you have the um, you have the presentation. Just a couple of slides from Sam on your email. And I think Sam, hopefully yeah. we can. I haven't filled enough time, so hopefully Sam has overcome. Yeah, her. Sure. fill space. Yeah. Well, you, you may make a start, Isabel, uh, and okay. Sam will have to come in when she can. Okay. So I think really it was to induce um, Sam, uh, she has taken over as Assistant Director from Education Strategy Infrastructure from Sebastian Gasser, um, who has come to this board previously and um, has now left Children's Services um, as a part of a new, a new, a new role he's got. Um, could you go down to the next slide, please, Leah, if that's OK? So just to recap from the report, um, what we're trying to do is come to the board with this proposal, which is around ultimately to achieve best value from this annual contribution um, that we've been receiving from uh, the Great Knowledge Growth Board. So we're, we're asking members of the board, firstly, to agree future funding allocations um, to be used um, in whole or part to repay um, Norfolk County Council's borrowing on condition that it's used to support only those schools within the Greater Norwich Infrastructure Plan um, School Capital Programme. Um, any residual um, funding, so if it's not all needed, that would be um, directed to individual projects um, approved by the board. The second request is to agree um, future allocations um, to be committed to the programme rather than just individual projects. As I say, again, um, on condition that um, we produce um, acceptable reports and updates um, to the Greater Norwich Growth Board. And finally, to consider um, an uplift of the existing two million allocation um, to two and a half million pounds, basically to reflect levels of inflation since the amount was agreed in 2017. We accept it was never agreed at the time that it would be, um, it, it would never be subject to indexation, indexed. but actually, um, yeah, sorry, indexed. Um, uh, we accept that that was never agreed at the time, but um, obviously, uh, in real terms, the two million pounds has, has gone down since it was originally um, originally allocated. 
Sam, did you want to step in? I can try. Ah, oh, we can hear you now. Wonderful. Over okay. to you. Not normal for a head teacher, an ex head teacher, to ever ever have a problem being heard, but that appears to have been the case in this case. I'm obviously not quite sure where uh, Isabel got to, and I'm sure she started uh, and, and, and identifying that we're really grateful that we've been able to bring the paper here today, uh, and also grateful for the way in which uh, the Greater Norwich Way Board has, has been able to previously support our statutory duty to give us the certificate of places. Um, we know, I know, although I am new, as I think I heard Isabel mention as I was leaving, uh, as I was kind of exiting the meeting the first time, um, we, there have been many historical discussions around this, uh, and we've hoped, and we hope that we've covered all of the issues and concerns that were raised in, in the way in which we've literally covered it in the report and how we've covered the elements around how we might future report and how the funding would be allocated and used and how it's been protected. As a, as I said, I'm three weeks into the role, so I brought Isabel to, as my expert and my lead to make sure she can answer questions. I didn't expect to throw her into it straight away by picking that straight up from me. But we're asking you to consider these three recommendations, particularly around the ways one and two, around how we utilise the funding that you have provided us through the infrastructure investment fund and how we, and, and, and the potential uh, look to increase uh, duty to reflect the levels of inflation. And we would ask you to consider that with backed up by the information that's in our report. We wanted to open it up to any questions. Good. Well, well, we've got Andrew first. Go on, Andrew, and then Trevor. Well, not so much a question, Chair, but just more comment because you already remarked on the uh, on the big program of of schools uh, in the Greater Norwich area to to match the development the uh, the overall development program as well. So that's a a major part of this, but. Certainly, I've been one who supported the uh, the approach to use this money as leverage uh, for borrowing rather than sort of direct contributions. So you've heard me say that at previous meetings. So I'm pleased it's come forward in this way and recognising what well, you and I have said that way a number of times that this is the better way to do it. And if we can find that way, or sort of recognise it that way, all of us, then it's a good thing. And uh, you no, know, if we need the the uplift, if we can manage the uplift as well from two to two and a half million. There is a necessity to borrow uh, from the county council's point of view uh, to get all these uh, this program of schools done. And if you can facilitate it this way, then to my mind, this is a good way. So I'm more than content with the with the proposed recommendation. Well, Trevor. Uh, yeah, Chairman, thank you. Just a couple of questions which hopefully should be straightforward to answer. Um, in um, Annex 2, the basic needs allocation is listed question what i can't see in that is the allocation of that because i think that's the totality of the basic needs allowance for the whole of the county and therefore what proportion of that is being applied to schools requirement within the greater norwich local plan area um, and the second that i don't see the higher needs um allocation there at all and again the same question applies to to both of those capital pots and just one question around the use of funding to support the borrowing does that does that infer then that there's an obligation or or would it be done in the same way as we've been looking at for the long stratton um, bypass in terms of the principal borrowing sits with the lead authority and the obligation for the debt remains with the local authority rather than it being drawn to us. Hopefully those three questions are tolerably straightforward to address. Well, there you go. Let's, okay. let's, ask, let's ask the hard sums questions to Sam because you're a teacher. You know about hard sums. Um, you are, I guess. Um, from the third, uh, from the third point to pick up the finance, yes, that is around uh, the funding. Is the borrowing is of, of the um, from the general account council, and so that does fall with us in terms of uh, paying back and the kind of uh, liability, I guess, around that. So this sits with us around that the same way. I, I assume I don't know what the long track road does, but I assume in the same way the long track road. If I hand over to um, Isabel around picking up the annex. 
Yeah, thanks very much. Um, so in terms of the allocation of basic need, we haven't pro provided this information in this report. We can we, and we, we do have it available. All I can say, though, is there have been considerable contributions um, from basic need to large scale projects um, in the Greater Norwich area. Um, just completed is the expansion of um, Sprouston Community Academy. Um, which is is in the report that you've received um, that was actually not funded by SIL but some residual section 106 that was spent at the school and that was I think about four million pounds worth of section 106 and another four million of basic need so quite a considerable amount as you can see in terms of and the other main um, project that's just about to complete um, is at uh, almost in Victory Academy in Cossey, where you had there were two years allocation of SIL funding, so four million and another five million pounds of basic need. So just I think just those two projects alone, you can see that as you'd expect, um, the Greater Norwich um, area does um, consume a large amount of the growth in Norwich in in Norfolk anyway. So as a, it, you would expect to see a large proportion of that basic need allocation coming into this part of uh, these parts of the county. As part of our reporting in the future, I'm happy to give them more detail and we can do as an, in, an interim as well to demonstrate where that's been allocated. Um, the the um, Norfolk County Council um, whole capital programme sets that out, but other future areas um, expected are Wyndham and Heatherset, also in Greater Norwich. So it, there are other parts of the counties. So, for example, um, in particular, um, Kings Lynn, that would be another growth area as a, as a large urban area. But actually, the real focus is around A11 um, and Greater Norwich generally. So a large proportion of the basic need funding that becomes available has been spent in Greater Norwich. Um, in terms of the um, high needs capital, um, that uh, again, where we've got large urban areas, you'd expect to see that, but that's probably uh, been spread across the whole county more broadly because that um, uh, is trying to just meet and spread out the infrastructure, part, partly to make sure um, children are have their needs met as close to home as possible, but also ultimately as well with a, an eye on transport and the cost of transport. Um, also to try and reduce travel times as well in that respect. So um, it's a slightly different picture with um, uh, with the, the high needs capital, um, but certainly basic need is very much focused on our considerable urban areas in the Greater Norwich district. Okay, Sean. Thank you, Chairman. Yeah, I'd just like to pick up on a few of the elements in the different parts of the report. Um, and I'll just start perhaps where Trevor finished on Appendix 2. Um, and it does say in the report about the basic need allocation hasn't been included for 25, 26, 26, 27, 27, 28. Um, but realistically, shouldn't there be some assumption in there that there will be some funding come through? Um, it sort of makes sense. You know, normally when you do plans like this, you put an assumption in and then amend it or correct it as more information comes forward. But it seems that's been missing completely from those three years as it moves forward. Um, the, the other questions I have relate more to the detail of some of the schools. So again, um, in the report in section three, it refers actually to the schools listed um, on the um, Greater Norwich Infrastructure Plan, but there's 14 schools on that list and there's only 13 on this list. Um, and again, the one in the infrastructure plan is over 10 years and the one in this plan is over 13 years. Sorry, it's over five years. Now, I don't know if that's where the one school is missing, um, but it does seem a bit strange that there's only one school being delivered in the second five year tranche as such um, after what's listed here. The other thing I just like to try and understand a bit more is again is around this borrowing um it is the intent to to borrow the what looks like the 81 million in one go and then use this fund to refund to pay that interest and in which case you know not all of these schools will be delivering at the same point in time so there must be some mechanism there'll be some money there to be used well or, or rather than just leave it in the bank i wouldn't want to see that sort of money just sitting there if we borrowed it or is it on a cool down basis I'll pause there. There's a whole host of questions thrown at you, sorry. 
so certainly I'll pick up the um, issue around the basic need allocation. Um, it's it's based on a settlement that comes from the Treasury into the Department for Education. So we are not in a position to make any assumptions around the future funding of basic need because there isn't currently a settlement on which to do that. Um, we know um, uh, it's predicated on school um, forecasts and forecasts um, might mean that we for one year we don't get any funding and we know other local authorities have experienced that. So it would be a little bit foolhardy, if I'm totally honest, um, on the basis of what we know about basic need allocations, we can't make any any prediction about that. And it has it has gone up and down over the years. And um, we'd like it to be a steady um, income, but we, you know, as I say, it's it's based on demographics and school forecasts. So we would need to be very very cautious about making any assumption around that particular sum of money. And hopefully, obviously, it's it's a bit unusual in that respect, unlike some other allocations, uh, where you have got a sense of where they're going. Um, the other issue around the numbers, I, I confess, trying to, I was trying to look very quickly around the numbers. What we try and do is we're trying to look in five years because what we know from experience, and I know that the Greater Norwich Board will, will understand this, is um, we do try and forecast when particular schools come, uh, come forward. It's much easier to, to predict the first five years or even the first three years and then five years as, gets, as you get further away from this point in time, it becomes much more difficult to predict exactly the delivery time scales. So um, what we've tried to do is kind of pick a point in time and include all of the projects. Um, I'll have to go back and identify which one that, as I can't quite, as, I've, as you've been talking, I haven't been able to quite identify which one it is, but it'll probably just about where we've chosen to kind of pick a, a, a period of time in which where we've got greatest certainty um, around the delivery. Um, and, it, and I see Grace has got a hand up. I don't know if you wanted to talk about the, the borrowing question or whether you want me to answer what I think and you come in. Yeah. Go on, Grace. So I wanted to come in just to clarify the, the distinction between the long and bypass borrowing, that there is actually a difference between the borrowing that um, the GNGB already has agreed to undertake and what this new proposal is. Anything that the GNGB has um, uh, borrowed in regard to the city deal borrowing and is, is using the seal to repay, there is a, you have a legal agreement which um, ensures that when your income comes in, the first call on that income is actually to repay initially the Board of North Way and then the Longstreet and Bypass. This agreement will not be the same. This, this, this paper is actually recommending that um, County Council are doing their borrowing. They will do the borrowing. I can't explain how much. And that's up to Isabel to answer. But they will borrow what they need. And on a year on year um, basis, um, you will be asked how much that you are able to um, commit to help them first of all repay that any borrowing that they've done for this capital program and if there is more if they don't need as much just for the borrowing that it could be up to 2.5 million could be topped up with cash towards specific projects hopefully that makes sense but the risk of the borrowing sits with county council and you're not committing the longer term um, um, as you would be with long and bypass if i hope that is a point of clarification because it, it is different um, and quite important. I think you might have confused everybody. I think Trevor might have got the answer. <laughs> Come on, Trevor. Is, is there a final question? Sorry, Grace. Is there a final question that there was answered about how we would draw down the borrowing? Um, uh, and, and the response to that is it would be drawn down as the projects come forward. It wouldn't just sit there on the balance sheet. So um, and, and that's where I think the point Grace was making about if, if it actually goes as cash towards individual projects, we'll do that. But it's just to, uh, where we need more than the, um, the money that's currently available. Um, we, we would draw it down on a on need to have basis rather than just have it sitting there. Have I gone? Yeah, John, so, so thank you. I, I was just going to say that makes uh, absolute sense. And thanks, Grace, for that clarification. What that does mean is that the Appendix 2 becomes really important, both in terms to identify that the borrowing is being used against schools within the Greater Norwich area, and also that there's a proportionate, and I know it will be difficult to work out, of appropriate proportion of high needs allocation coming in, so that actually the ability to borrow is not effectively releasing high needs allocation for the rest of the county. And I think that comes down to our effective reporting as we come through each of the next. Um, yeah, but it, mean, it just means that, that that needs to be recognised in what we're looking at in the reporting. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I'm very clear, and, and what we want to do is be able to set that out so that, that, so that is really clear in any reporting we do as we move forward. 
Thank you. Okay, you fixed your computer now. It's on the blink again, Sam, but keep going. Al, uh, Sean, Sean, then Alan. Thank you, Chairman. Um, yeah, just, just coming back to the this needs question, and, and I, I understand why it's not put in the schedule from the explanation given, but it just seems a bit bizarre that we'd be building all these schools if we don't have the extra need and therefore we wouldn't receive the the funding in some way, shape or form. Uh, it just feels a bit strange that we couldn't make some assumption around that. But again, that's not really important for today. Um, the borrowing aspect, thank you for clarifying that. So, it, so it, and again, just to, to summarise what I've heard. Um, so the money, the £2 million element will be used um, initially to cover any borrowing for the Greater Norwich area. Um, and then if there's any surplus, then that balance will then be used effectively as capital money to, to support schools and the delivery um, in, in that way. So, th so th that to me clarifies that. So I think that that puts that in the right, right place in, in that understanding of what that's about. Um, you could say, yeah, the, the number in, a, in Appendix 1 is there as an illustration um, on, on the need um, for the quantity of cash. But if you're calling down on, on a needs basis, then that's not what's going to be needed on day one as such. And effectively, the schedule then doesn't work through in that way. But it's, it's there as a illustration. So I, I can see that in that way. And yeah, coming back to Andrew's point right at the beginning, I'm, I'm fully supportive of being able to use the... Um, funding that we're providing through the growth board to to support the borrowing to enable a bigger delivery plan to, to be enabled yeah. so that that to me makes perfect sense in, in a way of taking this forward so provided it doesn't transfer a liability that's exactly right alan so on the um future projects there are no schools within the administrative area of norwich i just wondered why why that is i mean there's obviously criteria and i can understand growth areas outside of norwich but um if you could elaborate on that please um you want, i'm happy to pick this one up i think there is one that um and i think a part of the report there is a caveat around there are other pro there are other schemes that could join um so it is likely that um there is a school site identified as part of the east norwich master planning so that is one where we are likely to see Nor a, a scheme in Norwich come forward. As, as you quite rightly say, it is based on, um, or one of the other members said, it is largely based on need. And we don't have that kind of large scale development that would bring forward um, uh, a new school site in, in the Norwich area, aside from what we would expect to come out of East Norwich. I'd also surmise that um, you know the growth of the market in education with with with, with free schools probably as results in some overcapacity as well. Um, I think in Norwich there have been um, probably more free free schools come through in that way, um, where we may have had plans in previous iterations of the infrastructure plan for sites in Norwich. There have been probably more um, free schools come forward via the the Department of Education than we've seen anywhere else. So um, whether it's I don't in some respects I don't think it's necessarily over capacity, but it's met the need in a different way um, to the local authority having to um, deliver schools un, under its statutory um, duties. Okay, thanks, Graham. It may, it may just be worth noting, particularly for Councillor Waters' benefit, that actually on table two, it's identified that because of the growth in Bothorpe, there's a need to, uh, this is page 138, identify increased pupil places across a number of existing schools. But um, that's erroneously attributed to Broadland District, which is a minor glitch in the report. Okay. Gently done. That's very nice. Good. Okay. So I think we're there. I mean, looking at the recommendation, he's just trying to turn back to the page again. I think there's the, we're being asked to approve the principle you know, that the two million pounds can, can support borrowing. I think we've, we've exhausted the conversation about, well, does that give you a blowback on the, um, on the liability? And I think we've all heard that no, it doesn't. There is the IFF um, allocation for the Greater Knowledge Infrastructure Plan Capital Programme. So it's a basket 
as opposed to individual projects. So we've so I think we're ready to approve the principle and the notion that there's a basket rather than named schools. I mean, to consider uplift of the two to two and a half million. Well, nice try, Sam. We're in the middle of a budget year. So I'm sure we can consider this, but in line with everybody else, um, you know, because we, we get our, Grace, remind me, when do we get the financial sort of um, balance sheet that we sort of allocate the budget for the whole year rather than sort of in-year adjustment? So that's um, the next meeting, the 15th of December. So well, subject to what you agree today, we can obviously um, put a different figure in. Um, yeah, but I think we just need to see what the headroom is on all the other projects. Look, we, there's a third of a billion pounds worth of co commitment uh, we've seen on a, on the previous item. So I just we just can't in mid year just say you know make make the case, Sam, and let's let's hear what okay, well, comes we'll out. Reporting that we go more evidence to what the um, our system and, and the schools will have on on the Greater Nor Norwich area in future. I'm really sorry, my system is really buggy. So I know you can barely hear me, um, but we, we hope therefore we'll be able to put forward to you later with our reporting and our effective demonstration of the impact that those schools and infrastructure have on the infrastructure, how much work, how worthwhile that, that additional funding would be. My father would say, don't talk yourself in and out of a deal. You've got two out of the three. That's probably, let's bank that for today. And then you can sort of do a bit of horse trading with the other colleagues. Oh, <laughs> We do that good. Okay, so I'm sensing there's agreement in one and two on on page was it 140 of the printed papers, and a mm, wait and see on the third one, which is about boosting to two and a half. Is that a fair summation, gentlemen? Yeah, I'm getting a thumbs up from Sean. Yeah, not not from everybody else. Yeah, good. There you go. Well, so you've got two out of three. Ain't bad. There's a song about that. Right, let's now move on to page, he says, 146. So thanks for your attendance, Sam. You can say if you like, or turn, you can turn your computer off and on again so we get the sound working. Turning it off again, normally works. Right, agenda item number eight, page 146, uh, match level funding projects. I think this is a case of, you know, this coming slightly out of sequence. However, there's good reasons for that, uh, Phil, you're leading on this. Well, I'm, I'm sensing that Graham's itching to have a word, but you better you better take us forward. And then, thanks, John. Um, yeah, just so uh, you've already said, there is normally a sequence to agreeing this, which we're very familiar with on an annual basis. But actually, the project we saw earlier, Broad and Country Park, came out of sequence, where you've got a strategic or a, a, a crucial um, reason. For bringing it early then we do consider projects early uh, these are two such examples slow bottom park uh, and guild hall uh, the the fact is that there is some significant luff money available but that does need a clear commitment uh, from greater norwich for match funding um, in a timely manner so that's why that this report is before you today covering those two sites um, the details of each of the projects are appended, so I'm not going to go through those in detail having regard to the time that we've got left, uh, but certainly Slow Bottom Park does present some significant recreational enhancements uh, to both 3G Pitch, Pavilion, as well as other uh, recreational facilities. A uh, project of over £8 million, uh, and this is seeking match funding of approximately 850000 Guildhall. Uh, and Exchange Street, again, details in the appendices, but offering uh, significant public uh, enhancements to that area, improving pedestrian and cycle flows, looking to relocate the taxi rank, a £5.89 million project with approximately £2.77 million match. The recommendations before you uh, are to, uh, for the Greater Norwich Growth Board, uh, to support uh, the levelling up fund application bid uh, and to pre-commit those sums that I've referred to, the 850 and the 2.7 uh, million pounds to those projects, albeit that they will then come back before the growth board uh, in the annual investment plan in due course. But it, it's seeking to give that certainty uh, to that bid. I'll stop there, Chair. Thank you. Well, I think the, the, from the Chair, if I may, 
that had given that certainty at this bidding time is really important. So the, the principle of you know, securing that money is, I don't think is in question from anybody, I don't suppose. I am somewhat anxious about the operation, which is a second order consequence that can come way down the line about moving the taxi rank. I had the misfortune to see on CCTV on a system which I have uh, in my business, uh, a young lady get brutally attacked early in the morning on a Saturday morning two weeks ago, fired the footage to the police. Um, it was sort of tucked down out of the way, really, and not lit and not many people milling around. And she was left on her own and you know, she drunk a lot as well. You could see that from the way she was holding herself at 4 a.m. And I'm quite anxious because at the moment, the, the taxi rank is, is used, it's well lit, there's lots of people milling around, it's right in the centre. And it's used by people who've probably had a bit too much to drink, might have left their friends behind or whatever. I'd be very anxious about the practicality for, in the grounds of public safety of moving that um, to somewhere sort of tucked out of the way where it's not well lit and there aren't a lot of people milling around. Um, as well as just being further away uh, on the interplay with the one-way system. So I think when the, when the time comes, we're just going to need to give that quite a lot of thought. If you drove in the city 10 days ago on the Saturday, it only takes someone to have a flat tyre or a radiator overheating for the entirety of the Norwich traffic system just to grind to a halt. And there was a two-hour traffic jam, and I'm not quite sure why. But I think we've also got to have regard to if we're constantly closing off these, these streets permanently, and if there isn't the opportunity to reopen them as a safety valve to clear traffic, then you know we're, go, we're actually going to fossilise Norwich. Now, I've spoken with Martin Wilby, and he assures me the design is that in a, in a case where traffic does jam up for whatever reason, you know, these gates can be opened you know, to provide the slack, the necessary slack, to clear uh, traffic. But I'd be, again, later on, I'd be very anxious to ensure that you know there is the opportunity to clear traffic in Norwich. Traffic chat, if Norwich gums up every Saturday, it's no good to anybody. And the prosperity of Norwich, you know, is is, is important to all of us. But that, hey, that's just a, a hobby horse of my own, really. Uh, the decision before us, I suppose, is really just to say, can we reserve the, the, the money for those two projects? I don't think that's in doubt. But Sean, should we have a debate? Thank you, Chairman. I guess my question is just, do we have the three and a half million pounds in the budget? Should we need it? Because I'd like to support the bid and hopefully we get the funds and hopefully it comes through. But it just means we need the three and a half million pounds. And do we have it in the budget to be able to spend it? Can anyone answer that question? Yeah, Sean, the simple answer is yes. Um, Grace um, will be able to pull the figures um, much more exactly than I can. But yes, there is the money in the budget. Um, clearly, you're going to have another round of bids coming forward this year, but actually, still income is still remaining buoyant, notwithstanding um, notwithstanding nutrient neutrality. But the flow, you know, those sites that are working already are still bringing a good flow of uh, sill in. From recollection, the pot is circa twenty million pounds as it stands at the moment. Uh, but if I've embarrassed myself and got that completely wrong, I'll let, let Grace come in and correct me. Yeah, Steve. Uh, as you say, Chair, the decision isn't about the, the kind of the closure or the traffic management. But given, given you've mentioned it, and just to kind of allay your fears, I mean, I think the fact that the that the proposal and, and of course that this has been consulted on, and I don't I don't have the kind of not that we'd want to get into the response to that, but the, the proposal is to move the tax rate a short distance and actually closer to the police station. So that that actually might might help in terms of uh, those sorts of things. Well, I think that's my concern because the police station is now closed at six o'clock and there's no street lights and it's miles away from anywhere. There's, there's, there's no yeah. footfall. There's that, I think that's the concern, that. Steve. <laughs> yeah, there's but there's no one style. in them. But there's no one in them. Yeah, but that's, that's not the decision, as you said. But those, those issues have been consulted on. Yeah, but the fact they've been consulted on doesn't necessarily be the big so I'm not going to go down the rabbit hole on this, Steve, but moving the taxi rank away from where it is at the moment outside both the, uh, an area where both the library, the school and the police station are closed, and there's lots of parked cars and there's no one milling around, seems to me to be retrograde to public safety. And that's what will need to be discussed at the time. But, that, but again, that's not what we're here to discuss 
today necessarily, but we're going to have to be cognizant of that. Otherwise, you know, ladies, and it's not just ladies, but people who are drunk too much, you know, are going to get abused again and preyed on, and that's not good enough. <laughs> Alan. Uh, yeah, uh, I, I did put it in the chat because when, when we had a when we had a conversation, I think the the incident you that's right, yeah, yeah. witnessed was in Rose Lane. Yeah, but the point what? But the point was, it was in a darkened street out of the way. No, no, I appreciate I appreciate that. But then, if there if there are taxis waiting there, and they are you know usually taxis waiting, then that will be an observed mm -hmm. observed scene. I mean, I know, and, and you know, it's, it's a, you know, shows you 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 you're out all of it, but I, I think. As you say, second second order activity um, or second yeah. order issue, and I think it'll be okay. But um, you know, we just have to maybe agree to a difference in emphasis on that particular point. Yeah. Okay, so we're being asked to consider everybody that the money for Slay Bottom, which seems to be a great project, and the the Guildhall Hill Exchange Street, uh, two point seven million to be ring fenced and if you like earmarked i suppose i would say they're subject to that other bid but that seems that's the recommendation um and then pre-commit the sills of slow bottom uh to recommend the approval of the partner districts Jan Feb 2003 happy with that good right we're on page 104 oh and then, then there's all the other bits about all, all the stuff that goes in there as well so i think oh now press the wrong button uh, I think that's done us, hasn't it? I think we are. Um, I think that's brought us right to the end. Save that. If I go right back to the beginning, the date, I was sitting here borrowing page one five six. That's it. So I was looking for it, and I was. Pressing can't, it. can't believe you forgot long strap and bypass. No, I know. I haven't. I haven't forgotten the wrong strap and bypass. It's just this little meeting. Right, you've got uh, four minutes, uh, Phil, which is great. Yeah. So we could, yes. That's absolutely fine. I'll be quicker than that. You'll remember, because we've already talked about it, City Deal borrowing, or well, the City Deal uh, allocated £10 million to Long Stratton. Um, until recently, uh, it was seen as we didn't need all of that money. It was um, less than that, about £6.7 million. Uh, we all know the, um, the economic issue at the moment. Inflation is very high. These projects are really suffering with inflationary pressures. Uh, and so... Uh, what is being asked of the board today is to revert back to the original allocated £10 million for Long Stratton Bypass. Uh, there's also a second recommendation just re relates to some of the legal mechanisms around this uh, and uh, requesting, recommending, uh, agreeing, signing a deed of variation just to in the, in, ensure that it is legally robust and watertight. Uh, the report explains the rest. And again, I'll leave it there, Chair. Good. Right. So is that, are we all happy with that? Does everyone, I mean, it's it's got to come back to the, the councils, but yeah, Sean. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Just, just a few questions relating to this. So the £10 million that got changed to the £6.7 million, is that part of the... Um, £20 million pounds that we're moving forward to borrow, or is that in addition to that £20 million pounds and therefore we'll still leave that £20 million pounds outstanding? Yeah, use? those two things, um, Sean, are separate matters. So there's a £10 million pounds allocated uh, for Long Stratton Bypass. Uh, in the same way, there's £40 million pounds allocated for Broadwood Northway. Um, the £20 million pounds that we've recently discussed is a loan facility that we can loan to developers. And there is 4.5 million pounds expected to be paid as a developer contribution. But in that particular case, South Norfolk would draw down four and a half million of that 20 million, loan it to the developer, underwrite that risk, and then repay it back into a separate fund. So the 20 million you're referring to and the 10 million that is the subject of this report are two separate things. <coughs> Okay, th th thank you for that, Phil. So it's just clarifying that they were different things. I just didn't want to make sure that we've taken money from the same pot. On the change request, it seemed a bit strange, and you mentioned it there, the four and a half million pounds developer contribution has gone, 
or you could say has been moved as part of the 10 million pounds but the, there's there's an uplift of 5.5 million on the local contribution which i'm assuming includes that four and a half million pounds although the narrative below that seems to indicate that we have no idea where that's coming from because we're looking to resolve it i uh, sorry sean you're gonna have to help me can you point me to the exact paragraph that you're referring to it's on page one six four right at the bottom it refers to the funding gap still remains around the local contribution and the project is seek is still looking to resolve it but it now doesn't mention the developer contribution of the yep. four and a half million pounds that's not separated and i understand that was part of what we talked with the loan agreement and using that through yep. so, central for council so so that that i would have thought would be part mm. of that 10 million pounds and therefore we have a shortfall of 5.5 million by the sounds of it yeah, so just very quickly, and my apologies, I'm going to be quick. So if I don't answer your exact question, then forgive me. There is the, the four and a half million pounds from the developer has not been finally secured because you haven't got a planning permission and a sub and a section 106 at this point in time. But everyone is all saying the same thing that four and a half million pounds will come from the developer for this. In terms of the gap, yes, there is at this point in time a gap of circa nine million pounds. And you know, that is that is at this point in time in a state of the economy when it's going up and down, it's hard, really hard to absolutely specify what that increase is going to be. But as a starting point, um, we would obviously increase from the 6.7 to 10 million. That still leaves a gap of circa five, but that's that's still a gap that's got to be funded. The four and a half is still going to be funded by the developer. So I, I'm sorry if I've not explained that very well, but there is still going to be a gap if there is an increase of nine million pounds due to cost, uh, due to inflationary costs, then there is still going to be an overall gap of about nine, somewhere in the region of three and a half funded by the increase back up to the city deal borrowing. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, I, I get that. Thanks, Phil. That that where our gap now sits is some of it's been taken up by the increase to the ten million pounds, and the remaining gap still sits there over and above the developer contribution. Is is if, yeah. if what I'm hearing yeah. is is correct? Yeah. Well, you put that so much more succinctly than than me waffling on. So my you, yeah, you, exactly. you gave me time to think about it while you were talking. So thank you for yeah. that. Good. So we we still have a gap, but overall that the, the it's it just I, I think the change request didn't put it very clearly yeah. the fact that it almost showed that we'd lost the developer contribution yeah. which was no, perhaps incorrect in the way that it was positioned yeah, yeah the developer contribution is subject to a, a, an adopted plan policy so you can have confidence that it can be delivered but it's just not sealed in in legal to documentation now okay so um are we happy with the recommendation i'm not seeing anyone shaking their head good thumbs up Brilliant. Okay, last one. Item number 10. I'm really sorry this has lasted so long, but we've had a good knockabout on everything. Um, 15th of December, 2 p.m. Looks like the favoured date. Put it in your diary. And I mean, we've said we'll meet virtually, but I mean, is there an appetite to meet in person? In Norwich somewhere? I mean, Norwich would be more convenient. Andrew, are you putting forward your new Edwards print, perhaps? Or? Oh, I'm happy to host it at Cannon Hall. Yeah, no problem at all. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm conscious it's inconvenient um, to get down to Long Stratton, although our office will be closed by then. But, um, but look, why don't we see if we can meet in person, I think, with, an, with a hybrid option if we can. Yeah, Good. Well, let's accept your invitation, uh, Andrew, uh, and let's put your new media suite to use. Brilliant. Okay. So in person on the 15th, if we can. Um,